Greetings and welcome, Seaside Shadows members and friends. Today, you join me at Cedar Hill Cemetery, as I'm going to talk to you a bit about one of the most important and controversial figures to be buried in Connecticut, Samuel Colt. You can tell from the sheer size of this monument that this person was not only important, but incredibly wealthy. In fact, Samuel Colt would be one of the richest people in America at the time. However, it didn't always start that way. Samuel Colt was born in <clears throat> July of 1814. He was born to Christopher Colt, a farmer, and Sarah Colt Caldwell. He had humble beginnings. His father, being a farmer, could not afford to support the anywhere between seven and nine reported uh, siblings that Colt had. So what was he to do? He sold Colt, Samuel Colt into indentured servitude to another farmer. Yes, that's right. One of the richest men in America came from beginnings of indentured servitude. However, his childhood was not all bad. In fact, he had something that was one of his prized possessions that would later shape his entire life. His grandfather, his mother's father, had been a major in the Continental Army, and when he had passed, he gave Sam his flintlock pistol. It would shape Colt's life. <laughs> he became fascinated with the workings of the pistol and would never let anyone else take it. Sam had a lot of tragedy in his life, however. When he was just six years old, his mother died of tuberculosis, and it didn't take long for his father to remarry and then move to the city, giving up on being a farmer and deciding instead to be a businessman, working with textiles. It wasn't just his mother's life he would see lost, though. At age 19, his eldest sister, Margaret, died of tuberculosis as well. A little while later, another sister, Sarah Ann, committed suicide. Colt had seen all of this tragedy, and yet one theme that you're going to hear again and again and again is perseverance. Colt persevered. No matter the hardship, he saw through. He had a drive that can't not be matched. While he was in indentured servitude, he was allowed to attend school. While somewhere between indentured servitude and school, he came across a book. That book was the Compendium of Knowledge. The Compendium of Knowledge was a scientific encyclopedia. Two things captured Sam Colt's attention. Robert Fulton and explosives, specifically gunpowder. He became obsessed with explosions, and he vowed that he would etch his own name alongside the inventors of the Compendium of Knowledge. He would be an inventor. But what was the impossible thing that he was going to tackle? What would he do that no one else had ever done before? <coughs> At age 15, because of the success of his father's textile factory, he moved and moved back in to live with his father to work at his factory. While there, he had access to things uh, that he otherwise wouldn't have, and he actually built a working battery, a homemade galvanic cell. This would be the first thing, but not the last, that he would invent. Unfortunately, the run of bad luck that had just started in his childhood would never leave Samuel Colt during his life. On the 4th of July of that year, he used the galvanic cell to create a massive explosion 
on the 4th of July. The celebration was amazing, but something happened a year to the date the very next year. Another explosion. This one caught fire to the entire school and burned it down. Was it Samuel Colt that had burned down his school? There's no evidence of this, but the timing does seem rather odd, especially with the fire purportedly being started by a huge explosion. After this, Sam was sent away. His father could no longer keep him. So he decided he would become a seaman. He spent two years at sea aboard a ship called the Corvo, going back and forth from America to Calcutta, India. It was there during the sea voyage that he would become obsessed with the wheel mechanism. You see, it had a cranking uh, clutch that could be used to directly line up, very similar to Colt's idea that would spring to his head for a revolver. But why guns? After all, he had been interested in explosions and uh, gunpowder. But why guns themselves? Well, a tale goes that when he was a child, Sam Colt overheard two soldiers talking. They were talking reverently about the new double-barreled rifle and how it could fire two shots without the person having to reload. But they... uh, continued to talk in hushed voices, the thought that someone could do the same thing with four or five shots, that was impossible. Colt had taken it upon himself to do the impossible, and he became fixated with creating a gun that you could shoot without having to reload. Thus, While he was at sea aboard the Calcutta, he created his very first prototype of a pepper box flintlock pistol. The pepper box flintlock pistol existed already. It was a multi-barrel shot uh, pistol. The problem was the barrels rotated and you had to rotate them by hand. The likelihood that you had the precision to line up a shot and that it wouldn't somehow backfire was not good. Colt's prototype fixed this, and when he eventually returned to America, he brought the prototype to his father. His father took a look at the prototypes and all but dismissed them. To, To him, Sam was living in a fantasy world. He would never perfect a repeating pistol, or rifle. Still, though he did not believe in his son, he did agree to finance two models, a pistol and a rifle, based off of Colt's designs. The tests didn't go well. The rifle fired accurately at first, but then kept jamming and would not stop jamming. The pistol exploded. His father refused to finance anything more for the young Colt, and he was left, again, searching for the avenue that he could get his dreams accomplished. So what was a guy to do? If you had thought that the answer would be nitrous oxide, a.k.a. laughing gas, you probably are a very good guesser or a fortune teller. But that was exactly what Colt decided to do. He would travel around pitching and demonstrating the benefits of nitrous oxide, something that he had learned about on the floor of his father's factory talking to one of his chemists. He uh, lauded himself as the celebrated Dr. Colt, changing his last name from C-O-L-T to C-O-U-L-T and hailed himself out of New York, London, and Calcutta. His life as a traveling salesman convinced him that he could do this. His shows were very popular and widely attended. 
and he sold a lot of the nitrous oxide. Over time, though, interest in the demonstration and the novelty of such a thing like laughing gas began to wear off. His shows, his ticket sales were down. They were sparsely attended. He needed something. The serious talks and lectures were no longer drawing the cloud, <clears throat> excuse me, crowds that they used to. So an idea came to him one day. While in Cincinnati, he partnered with a sculptor named Hiram Powers to create a theme and a show for his new demonstrations. The theme would be based off of Dante Alighieri's The Divine Comedy. Hiram Powers would sculpt in intricate sculptures, wax, and then Colt would blow them up using his own explosives. This was a hit. He made a name all across America as the fantastic Dr. Colt. But he didn't want to be known for a traveling medicine salesman. Despite the popularity that it was bringing him, it was not his dream. He would never join the men that he had read about in the Compendium of Knowledge by being a traveling salesman of nitrous oxide. It was not his invention. And so, he began to make concrete steps towards turning his vision, his dream, to a reality. At this time, the picture in his head of the revolver was slowly evolving into what we know it as, the Colt Revolver. A single fixed barrel revolving chamber pulled into place by a hammer and locked with perfect alignment. The likelihood of it backfiring or user error was diminished. <clears throat> Using this, he filed for a patent, but not in America. It was advised to him by his business partners that he should file a patent in England first. And so in 1835, first he got a patent in England and then subsequently in France as well. Those two foreign patents, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, those two foreign patents secured, he made his way back to the United States and in February of 1836 would secure a patent for his design. His dreams were finally coming true. <clears throat> At first, he partnered with a group, a conglomeration of businessmen, specifically his cousin Dudley Selden, and they sh set up shop in Patterson, New Jersey. Colt sold the patent rights to the conglomerate for a royalty with the stipulation that if they ever disbanded or the factory ever went under, the rights would revert to him. Despite common belief, Colt didn't invent the revolver. He merely perfected the idea and made a way that he could mass market it. Though his demonstrations were still popular and he was still doing them at the time, <clears throat> he needed to, uh, something more. So with a, another loan from the same cousin, Dudley Selden, he brought the patent and the design of the gun to President Andrew Jackson. Jackson loved the gun and lauded over it. He even gave Colt a note saying that he wanted them for the U.S. Army. And through that, Colt secured a demonstration in front of Congress of his uh, both revolving pistol and a mo uh, prototype of a revolving rifle. The demonstrations, though he thought that they went well, seemingly went nowhere. He could, he could acquire no purchase order from the United States military. Something that compounded this problem was that if the United States military would not purchase his firearms, then the Militia Act of 1808 said that no state militia could use his firearms either. And so if the United States Army would not adopt them, 
what was he going to do? Worse, even still for the business than all of that, was the fact that Colt was a reckless spender of company funds. He would often be chastised by his cousin about reckless spending, about needless gifts that he was giving to foreign agents or heads of state. <clears throat> Fortunately for Colt, war against the Seminole natives uh, down in Texas briefly saved Colt's company. His advanced design for the repeating rifle ended up causing more confusion than not and ended up with the soldiers often breaking the guns apart in their hands. It was not good. And despite a rework, problems continued for Colt. In late 1843, his New Jersey Patterson shop closed. A public auction was held in New York to liquidate the most public, er, profitable assets. It seems like as quickly as they had come, Samuel Colt's dream and vision had died. But this is a story of perseverance. He would not be deterred. Though his gun dreams were set to the side, this man was a brilliant inventor. And it is not just the perfection of the revolver that he should be known for. In fact, he began manufacturing and selling what was known as underwater electrical explosive detonators, aka the first underwater remote controlled mine. He would also create a waterproof underwater cable. He would team with Samuel Morse, yes, of the Morse code and the telegraph, to lay telegraph cables all across America using his technology. Though his name was already out there, this got him even more renown. They even attempted to lay a telegraph cable across the Atlantic Ocean. Morse would be a good partner for Colt. <clears throat> With uh, his success and his new cachet behind his name, he tried again to raise funds to resurrect the Patent Arms Manufacturing Company but could find no investors. Even worse, the tragedy struck again. At this time, his brother was arrested and convicted of murder for murdering one of Samuel Colt's partners, a printer that he had worked with. This unfortunately put a stigma on Colt's name, the family name in general. His brother, was condemned to be executed, and on the day that he was to be, he killed himself instead. More tragedy for Colt. He would not be deterred, and somehow all of this bad luck meant that he was due some good luck. Someone had fallen in love with Samuel Colt's repeating revolvers. A uh, captain uh, Samuel Walker of the Texas Rangers had fought against the Seminole natives and had led a contingency of 15 men to a victory against 70 armed with just the revolvers. He knew that they could be used to take out a much better trained and larger force. And so he wanted a thousand of the guns. This of course, would put Colt back in business. Sam, or Sam Walker had even tracked uh, Samuel Colt to New York specifically to talk to him. He had placed that order for a thousand, but had very specific parameters and modifications that he would like to see introduced to the revolver. Much to everyone's surprise, Sam loved the modifications, one of the most important ones being holding six shots instead of five. But Sam knew that he could not make 2,000 guns alone, and so he reached out to investors again, who agreed this time to finance. More specifically, he found a partner, 
Eli Whitney Blake, nephew of Eli Whitney, inventor of the cotton gin. Eli Whitney Blake was himself an inventor and had created a device, a machine, used to crush stone. Sam Colt knew of Eli Whitney Blake and brought him in to produce his guns. This new gun would be called, would be called the Colt Walker Revolver. <clears throat> with, the, with those orders secured, and a loan from yet another cousin, this one Elijah Colt, he built his own factory in 1855, the largest private arms factory that existed in the world at the time, in Hartford, Connecticut. It was called the Patent Firearms Manufacturing Company Factory at Hartford. Quite the mouthful. His first gun out of Hartford was known as the Whitneyville Hartford Dragoon. It was at this time that Colt's guns became so popular that people had just dropped the distinction and a revolver and a Colt were the same exact thing. They uh, became... His name became synonymous with sidearms. They would become sidearms for both the military and civilians alike, the popularity spreading vastly across all of the United States. It became known as the gun that won the West. <coughs> Excuse me. It was also the sidearm used by the United States military during the Mexican-American War. However, despite all of this newfound success, despite the way that his luck seemed to be going, tragedy and the curse loomed large. You see, Samuel Colt's patent was, excuse me, was only due to run until 1857, and the more he tried to lobby with Washington to get the patent refiled, the tougher and tougher and more opposition he ran into, until suddenly there was no opposition at all. It led to a lot of talk. What exactly had happened? Had Samuel Colt bribed the people of Washington? Had he bribed the statesmen to uh, expand and extend his patent so that he would be the only one making revolvers? An investigation was launched, but much to Colt's relief, the investigation revealed corruption, not on his behalf, but on the behalf of Washington. It exonerated him. He was a genius businessman and inventor, but perhaps one thing that goes untalked about that was perhaps the true genius of Colt was his idea. Uh, ability to identify talent. For the largest manufacturing private arms company the world had ever seen, Colt needed help, and he decided to bring in a man named Elijah K. Root. Elijah K. Root brought with him the idea of the assembly line. Colt and, and Root were the first two to ever make use of the assembly line in manufacturing. It wasn't a new idea, but it had never been used in any industry yet. The interchangeable parts made it so that they could produce up to 150 firearms at this factory in one day, a number that before would have been unheard of. <clears throat> Colt's luck seemed to have changed. Though the tragedies and the curse perhaps loomed in the back of his mind, he met the love of his life, Elizabeth Jarvis, a woman he had known for some five years, who was 12 years his younger. When he was 41 years of age, they married. On June 5th, 1856, in a lavish ceremony. He even built her one of the largest mansions in Connecticut at the time, Armsmere. They were said to be happy there for some time. 
Not all Colt's ventures were successful. After fin finally establishing his Hartford store and getting it up and running, he tried to establish a factory overseas in London. He was still selling to states militia, the United States, and also other foreign governments. He had moved over to Europe uh, to launch his London factory, and though that was a success, he found that he could find no foothold with the foreign heads of state and the dignitaries. They viewed him as a civilian, and so what could he possibly know about firearms? He had no military rank or military experience. Why would he be a judge of what a good gun was? This was a problem for Colt, but one that he thought of an easy solution to. His name was well known throughout the states, and he was an important figure in Connecticut already. The business that his gun uh, factory brought in really set Connecticut apart. And so he went to the governor at the time and explained his problem. And the governor was happy to grant him the rank of lieutenant colonel and also make him an aide-de-camp to the state's militia. With new rank secured, he went back to Europe. <clears throat> His ventures, however, did not pan out. Eventually, the London factory would close, and he would have to uh, set his sights entirely on his business ventures in America. The Civil War was a very interesting time for Colt. He had been known, it had been his M.O., to play both sides. When he would uh, sell guns to a foreign government over in Europe that was embroiled in a war, he would very often turn around and sell the other side the same guns. And so the Civil War was a tumultuous period. He was from the North. His gun factory was in Connecticut. He was a Union man after all wasn't he? But he continued to sell guns to both sides up until uh, 1861. It had vilified him. The local papers had come out and had called him a southern sympathizer and a traitor to the Union. He could no longer find people to purchase his guns, and so he very quickly put a stop to that returning once again to talk to the governor of Connecticut. In response, the governor commissioned him a unit. They were the uh, first regiment of Colt's revolving rifles, and they made Samuel Colt a colonel. Colt was rather advanced in age at this time and was in very, very poor health. Perhaps it's for that reason that that regiment disbanded less than a month later, having never gone to war. This was enough to quell the public talk, though. Or perhaps it was just sympathy over the state that Colt found himself in. He was suffering from severe rheumatic arthritis. He also had gout. Very very bad gout. He would die of complications of this gout on January 10th, 1862. At his time of death, Samuel Colt and his factory had produced over 450,000 guns in some 16 different models. <clears throat> He was laid to rest on the Armsmere grounds, and later, when his son mysteriously died in his adult life, the mother, Elizabeth, moved the entire family to be interred here at Cedar Hill. When he died, he left a large family. His wife, his infant daughter, another daughter, the son, and his wife was still pregnant. 
The tragedy of the Colt family would not stop with just Sam's death, though. A few weeks after uh, his own death, the infant daughter passed away. A few months later, the other daughter did as well. And when Elizabeth finally gave birth, the child was born stillborn. They were left just Elizabeth and Caldwell. However, Samuel Colt had left them a fortune of some $15 million, which at the time, uh, which in today's uh, currency would be just under $400 million. She very quickly became one of the richest women ever in American history. It was said, however, that the curse of the Colts would follow both of them as well. Caldwell Colt, named for his grandmother's namesake, died mysteriously in his adult life. He was sailing off the coast of Florida, and there are conflicting reports as to whether or not he died of drowning, or of tonsillitis, or was shot by a jealous uh, husband of one of his paramours. When he died, Elizabeth would become the owner of the Colt factory, and Elijah Root would become the president. <clears throat> In 2006, Colt was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. One of the most famous quotes that spread around the time involving Samuel Colt, Colt <clears throat> excuse me, was that God had created men. Colonel Colt, with his revolver, made them equal. There remains some mystery about the Colts. Was the bad luck that Colt, that Sam continuously experienced during the course of his life, due? to his involvement with firearms? Later in life, were some of these bad things explainable by perhaps being cursed by the spirits of those that his weapons had killed? We may never know. What remains, however, true is the fact that Samuel Colt was one of the most influential figures in American history. And we are very lucky to have him interred so close to us in Connecticut. Thank you all so much for joining me for my tale about Samuel Colt. There does remain some mystery about him, and we will hopefully get a chance to investigate. For Seaside Shadows, I'm Andrew Hill. Thank you all.